Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. My name is Lena Wen, and I'm the 4-H Extension Agent for Fauquier County. The purpose of this program is to highlight Virginia grown produce and livestock that are raised on farms across the Commonwealth and demonstrate how to create a delicious and nutritious meal with a highlighted ingredient. Um, this educational program will highlight Virginia agriculture, community nutrition, and farm-to-table connections and is brought to you by Virginia Cooperative Extension. Uh, VCE is an educational outreach of Virginia's land-grant universities, Virginia Tech, and Virginia State University. VCE's educational programs are delivered through a network of faculty at these two universities, 108 county and city offices, 11 Ag Research and Extension Centers, and six 4-H Educational Centers. So I would encourage all of you to participate in your local VCE programs to learn more if you have not already. Today we're going to be focusing on potatoes. So Thomas Bowles is an ANR Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in Prince William County, and he's going to first teach us about growing uh, potatoes. Then Hannah Parker, who is a 4-H extension agent in Greensville, Emporia, she's going to teach us how to make cheese stuffed twice baked potatoes. Mary Beth Martin, 4-H extension agent in Bedford County, will be our Q&A monitor, monitor for today. So if you have any questions that you'd like presenters to answer, you can go ahead and put those into the Q&A box as they come up, um, but we will likely wait until the end to do questions. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Thomas. Okay, hey, again, my name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Ag Agent up in Prince William County. Potato. Potato. Tomato. Tomato. So what's in a name? Um, we all often call potatoes Irish potatoes, but they're not really Irish. They're Andean. Um, potatoes originated in the Andes in Peru and Bolivia. And interesting enough, there are tons of varieties. And in those countries, they have different varieties for different latitudes as you go up the sides of mountains. When the Spanish arrived in Peru and Bolivia, they thought potatoes looked like the sweet potato, whose species name is batata. And so they called them batata, which became patata and then eventually potato in English. Now potatoes, sweet potatoes, and yams all belong to the same plant order, but they live in different families. Potatoes are nightshades and we eat the tubers. Sweet potatoes are in the morning glory family and we eat the root. Yams we eat the tubers of, but they're actually more closely related to lilies than they are to potatoes. So we look at the history of potatoes They've been eaten for at least 8,000 years based on the archeological evidence. When the Spanish discovered them, they brought them to Europe. The story of potatoes being adopted in Europe is kind of interesting because as a nightshade, people were reluctant to eat them. Different countries tried different things. I believe it was Frederick the Great who had his gardeners put out potatoes where the public could steal them so that they would take the plants home and adopt them and start to learn how to take care of potatoes and eat potatoes. But here in Virginia, they were first cultivated in 1621. By the beginning of the 1700s, potatoes had become a staple of Ireland and actually several European countries. A lot of our Eastern European countries, potatoes were just as important as in Ireland. But we call potatoes Irish potatoes largely because we associated potatoes with the Irish who immigrated after uh, the great Irish potato famine. And that occurred around 1845-46 when late blight, which is a phytophthora, uh, wiped out the potato crops in Ireland and it caused a million deaths and a million and a half people to leave Ireland. And the Irish population, quite honestly, has, has not recovered from those losses. So if we look a little bit closer at the potato, um, one of the reasons why potatoes are so popular is because they're versatile to cook with and they're highly nutritious. They're the fourth most important food crop in the world. Corn, wheat, and rice are the only ones that are more important. 
And part of that is because on a per plant basis, potatoes can deliver more calories than just about any other plant. Here in Virginia, we've got about 42,000 acres devoted to potatoes. Most of them are on the Eastern shore. Most of our potato production is for fresh sale. There's some production for processing either as frozen potato products or as potato chips. If you're interested in learning more about how potato becomes a chip, I invite you to watch the Virginia Tech video, The Love of the Chip, and the URL is down there and we'll send that out when we release the video. Um, Route 11 potato chips are in Mount Jackson, I believe, in the Shenandoah Valley. And um, they're probably the most famous potato chip here in the Commonwealth. So if we look at potatoes and how they're used, a lot of times we classify potatoes by their color and then sometimes by their texture. And their texture really depends on, on how they're used. So white potatoes are a general all-purpose potato. Our red potatoes tend to be waxy. And because they're waxy, they hold their shape well and that makes them good for salads, good for things like casseroles, au gratin, soups, stews, those sort of things where it's important for the potato to hold its shape. Russet potatoes are starchy, which means when they cook, they get fluffy and they're really good for baking, roasting, mashing, and most importantly, frying. And I say that because most of the potatoes produced in the United States are Burbank russets. And the reason for that is that most of those fries go into French fries in the fast food industry. Yellow potatoes are an all-purpose potato Fingerlings are waxy potatoes, and our blues and purples are waxy to all-purpose, kind of depending on what variety it is. Um, the all-purpose ones tend to be on the thin skin side, and because they have a medium amount of starch, they can be used either as a starch or as a waxy type potato. So unlike previous presentations in this series, I'm gonna talk a whole lot about commercial production and how that's done. Um, but I focus on how you grow potatoes for yourself because this is one of the easiest plants to grow. And as I said, it produces a lot of vegetable per area. I will say that building your soil makes a huge difference in how you can grow your potatoes and how productive they'll be. There are basically two ways, and I'll explain a little more in detail. We either trench potatoes or we do it the lazy way. Um, potatoes are interesting because they have a chandelier growth pattern. What that means is that when you put the seed potato in the ground, that's the lowest you're ever gonna get potatoes. Potatoes are gonna grow upward, and that's why we mound potatoes. Potatoes will have white or purple flowers, and they'll look a lot like tomato flowers largely because tomatoes are their close cousins. Like tomatoes, they have similar fruit. Most of the time we harvest potatoes before we get to their cherry tomato-like fruits, um, but you don't wanna eat their fruit. All parts of the potato that are green are poisonous, whether it's the fruit, whether it's a potato that's been exposed too much to the sun and it's got green on it. Now, if you've got a potato that was exposed to the sun, you can lump soil on it and give it a few days and those toxins will leave. And when you uncover the potato, you'll find that that green's gone away. Your other option is to cut the green parts out and use the rest of the potato. So we don't actually plant seeds, we plant seed potatoes. Growing potatoes from seed is really long and difficult. And so seed potatoes are small potatoes that typically are left over from last year's crop. And here we've got examples of seed potatoes and a seed potato you need to make sure that you've got good eyes and the eyes are the little sprouting points that you'll see on the potato. Now you can use grocery store potatoes or farmer's market potatoes for seed potatoes. The important thing to realize is that particularly on the, well, 
on the grocery side, because farmers markets aren't going to do this, they tend to be treated with stuff that's going to slow sprouting. So if you want to use, if you have potatoes that you like, that you see at the store, you want to try and propagate them, that's fine. Just go for organic ones or go for farmer's market ones because they haven't been treated. Now with a seed potato or potato from your pantry, you can either plant it whole, which I like to do because I think it gives it a better head start, or you can cut up the potato as long as each section has some eyes on it. And typically, if you're gonna cut a potato up, you want at least an inch chunk of potato with an, at least two eyes on it. So when you cut the potato, what you get is on the left there, it's wet, it's shiny. Um, some people will plant their potatoes directly into the soil like that. Typically, you're better off if you let it dry overnight. And what that's going to do is that's going to form a light scab over it. Um, basically, the white part's going to get dark. And then it'll be better protected when you put it in the soil. It also will tell you is if your potato has some deep disease issues, because one of the things, particularly if you're getting a potato from the store, it may be carrying some disease. And if you see the picture on the right, you'll notice some of those white spots, that's fungus starting to grow. And so this potato is not one I wanna put in my garden. Excuse me, it's not one I wanna put in my garden. So we would discard that. And that disease is either from the potato itself or it's from the knife not being as clean as it probably should be. Um, in this particular case, I know the knife is clean because it just came out of the dishwasher. So I'm guessing that the bag of potatoes I got from the store had some sort of issue. It didn't make those potatoes inedible. It just meant that once you start growing it, you'll have problems. So these are other potatoes that uh, are store-bought potatoes you can see the eyes butting out. Now there's some people who will let the eyes butt out quite a bit before they plant them. Others will just put them out. I'm not sure it makes a difference one way or the other, um, other than it may give you a slight jump start on the, the green growth of the plant. So when we dig potatoes, basically we're putting them in trenches. And those trenches can vary anywhere from eight to, I've seen some potatoes put uh, two feet apart. And then you're gonna put those potatoes in the trench and cover them. And then as they grow, you'll hill them. And so here we have an example of some potatoes that were held over the previous year. Uh, this is at our demonstration garden in Bristow. And you can see these have already started to sprout they were left in a shed in the dark and so there's no green um, but this is fine to plant potatoes like this or you know if they have not yet budded so this describes the lazy way of doing potatoes and this is something we just started this year at our teaching garden Okay, this morning we are preparing our potato beds. We had a cover crop growing here, just like in this bed over here. We cut it down a few weeks ago, put black plastic over it. The black plastic is basically smothering what's left of the cover crop. After a few weeks, most of that cover crop is dead. And then we're left with what we have in this bed where we're planting our potatoes dead cover crop, a little bit of cover crop that is okay, but we were able to do some light tillage and kill that off. And now what we're going to do is we're gonna put some compost down, we're gonna lay out our potatoes, and we're gonna do potatoes the lazy way. Putting out potatoes, covering it with straw, and not digging the potatoes to do a no-till potato. Ellen's gonna explain the math we're going to talk about the actual planting of the potatoes now. This bed is four feet wide by 14 feet long. As Thomas mentioned, we already have let this 
die back and we're going to start by putting compost on it. But the actual math that follows it is as follows. We're going to plant the potatoes a foot apart in rows and then rows one foot apart all the way down the bed. We're going to plant three different types of store-bought potato seeds, an early season Red Norland, a mid-season Kennebec, and a late season Heirloom Green Mountain. And then we're going to do an experiment this year and we're going to use leftover seed potatoes from last year's harvest. So now we're going to go ahead and spread some compost across the whole bed before we plant any potatoes. And when you're planting anything, you always want to amend your soil. This is compost that we've made here in the teaching garden. We're gonna go ahead and actually plant the potatoes right now. We've spread the compost. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to plant the potato seeds approximately one foot apart in rows and rows one foot apart. So in this particular bed, that's going to give us three potatoes in each row. And we're going to be able to put three rows of each of the varieties that we've done. So we're starting with the early season, Red Norland. Starting about a foot in from the edge of the bed, both ways. And then I'll take the second one, put that about a foot in. And then the last one will go another foot, again, about a foot from that end and a foot from that end. And I'll plant two more rows of this. A foot this way. And then for our third row of our early season plants, the last three in. And we have, as I said, a mid-season, a late season, and then a few rows of the experimental seed from last year. So we're going to continue down this bed. Each variety is going to have three rows with three potatoes in each of them. Okay, so now we've got our seed potatoes out. We're gonna cover it with straw. Should be good. So six inches, maybe a little bit more here and there. Potatoes will grow up through this and make our job of harvesting that much easier because we won't have to dig down into the soil. It will all be in the straw layer. Potatoes are never going to grow deeper than the level we put the seed potatoes. So all our potatoes are going to be up here in the straw. And harvesting will be, as I said, very, very easy. I uh, apologize for all that jet noise. Unfortunately, our teething garden is in a flight path. So this is what potatoes look like when they first start germinating and coming up. And then once they get to a certain height, we're going to hill them. And whether you've dug potatoes or whether you've done it the lazy way and you have straw, you want to do that hilling so that you increase the volume at which you've got potatoes growing. So you're creating that depth that you really need for a good harvest. And so here's just harvesting the soil, or excuse me, hilling the soil. This is actually soil that was saved from when we dug the trenches with a little compost added in. Once we run out of soil, we'll eventually go to straw. And you don't really want to bury them with any kind of heavy soil. With straw, it's a little bit easier because it's not going to crush the plant. 
but basically you want to make sure that you're covering up those leaves and so the plant will grow up. The areas where it's been buried, that will produce side shoots and in those side shoots, that's where the potatoes will start to develop. You can see there's a lot of residue from the cover crop there and that's just there to help add carbon into the system to feed the microbes that are gonna make our plants that much healthier. And so that's kind of what we want. And so as that little one grows up and turns into that, we're gonna hill and hill and hill. And generally speaking, we stop hilling about the time we start seeing uh, a few of the plants flower. Sorry about that, slight technical difficulty. Actually, I'll go back to this. So in this particular picture, um, that brown potato, that's the seed potato. And you're looking basically at this moving up. These little tiny red are red Norlands that are starting to form. That big round red one is uh, the first tuber that was formed after the seed potato. Okay, so this is one of our lazy beds um, where it looks weedy because we reclaim that particular bed from a patch of turf, um, but we've covered it with straw. It's just about ready to be covered with straw again. In this particular case, we added straw and we also added some, we, this is about middle of May. And so we were prepping other beds get ready for warm season crops. We had standing cover crop of rye and we cut that down and we used some of that rye as mulch for those beds, but we also used it for beds in our potatoes. And you can do that and the nutrients from that rye are gonna go into the soil. They're not gonna burn the potatoes. And so this is another bed where we got really heavy at using uh, excess rye that we had. That's it a, a week or two later. So you can see the green has gone out. Those nutrients have started to go back in the soil. You can see that the potatoes have grown through it again. And so we're ready to straw that again. So when we talk about, okay, what do I have to do to some grow potatoes? In most of Virginia, sometime in March is when you really want to put potatoes in. Uh, we, in Northern Virginia, we typically do it around St. Patrick's Day. The thing is you want to make sure that the soil isn't too wet or the potatoes are rot in the ground. And so most years we shoot for St. Patrick's Day, some years we've had to go a little bit later. And if you're farther south in Virginia, you can probably get away with planting them earlier. And like I say, you want a minimum of nine inch row spacing the wider the spacing you have, the bigger the potatoes get. Most potatoes mature in 100, 120 days. And so when you go to harvest potatoes, there are two types of potatoes you can harvest. What we refer to as new potatoes, which are harvested while they're immature. And it's usually within six to eight, 10 weeks of planting. And basically what you're doing is you're excavating a little bit and you're taking things off the top. And that way you can have potatoes before everything's ready. But really when we're talking about mature potatoes, that's when the skins have thickened and the tubers reach about the size that you want. What I found is that plants tend to look kind of distressed about the time you're ready to harvest them. And one of the reasons I think we haven't had issues with disease, at least in our garden, is that as soon as they start to look dis distressed, we start harvesting. And then you want to take those potatoes and you want to set them aside. You want to let them cure for 10 to 14 days, cool temperature and high humidity. And the reason you want to do that is you want to get those skins to thicken up even more, which means they'll store longer. When you harvest the potatoes, you can either use a garden fork or a shovel. Um, whichever method you use, you're in inevitably going to either slice a potato or spear a potato, as we can see here. Um, 
where that potato has been cleaved by a shovel, you can wash that and use that pretty much right away, um, but it won't store. So russets can get fairly big. Um, last year we had a really good potato harvest and we had a really good season for it. And so we got big potatoes about that size when we harvested our russets. This year in our lazy beds, we had a really cold spring. We had several instances of frost damage, which this is the first year that I've seen that in probably 10 years. And so the potatoes you see there on the right, that's what we got from about six plants of Red New Orleans that were grown on that recovered bed, that new bed that hadn't been amended very much. And uh, that's, a, that's a function, I believe, of weather. Although you can see we still have a number of sizable potatoes there. Now, if you harvest potatoes when the skins are thin, they can be damaged really easy. And so in this picture on the left, you can see three areas that were damaged on these different potatoes. That was done by rubbing those potatoes. That wasn't done by anything else. And so the, thin, the skin is really thin in this case. And this is a reason why you'd wanna take them and let them cure for you know, two weeks, thicken up those skins and potatoes will last much longer. But these damaged skins one, you wanna use those earlier. Um, to give you an idea of some of the potato production you can get, on the right here, we've got a section of Green Mountains, which are russet heirloom potatoes. Um, this was a three by four section of garden bed. And this is after one harvest. Uh, we took new potatoes once, and then this is the potatoes that we got left when it was time to harvest them at the end of the season. So some common potato problems, uh, Colorado potato be beetles, Potato be be Colorado potato be beetles are our number one pest in our demonstration garden up here in Northern Virginia, um, but there are some others. Scab is a problem with potatoes, and generally speaking, you can get scab resistant varieties. If you have a variety that isn't scab resistant, if you grow it at a lower soil pH, you tend to have less problems. Leaf hoppers can be a problem. Slugs are a big problem particularly once you let the potatoes go too long. So if we look at the picture lower right, the circle, that's a slug that basically has eaten out most of what was our seed potato. And potatoes can get pretty much any disease a tomato can get because tomatoes, eggplant, tomatillos, they're all in the same family and so they share a lot of diseases. Some non-toxic solutions to think about. Floating row covers will do a lot to keep insects away. And basically what you're doing is you're putting this lightweight cloth over top of your potatoes as they grow. You'll have to take it up to hill, but otherwise you can pretty much leave it there. Um, you're not growing the potatoes for flowers, so it's not important that you have any kind of pollination. And then you wanna hand pick insects where it's practical. Using straw helps reduce a lot of the soil borne diseases that come from those diseases being splashed up on the plants when they're watered or when there's rainfall. And straw also makes a nice predatory environment for spiders. It's also helpful if you practice the soil health principles you can learn more about those uh, from NRCS, which is the Natural Resources Conservation Service of USDA. And basically, soil health is based on keeping plants growing in a bed all the time. That means using cover crops. Um, that means rotation to get diversity, minimizing disturbance. One of the reasons why we started experimenting with the strawing method or lazy method of potatoes is because we want to try and minimize disturbance. Um, and the other advantage of using rotation is 
it can help break pest and disease cycles. But the important thing is, if you're rotating plants, you don't want to go from one bed that had potatoes into a bed that had tomatoes or tomatillos or eggplants, because again, they're all in the same family and they share diseases. If you'd like any of the links in this presentation, so you don't have to copy them down, we'll email those out to you or you can send me an email and I'll be happy to send those out. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Hannah. All right, thank you, Thomas. Um, hi everyone, my name is Hannah Parker and as was mentioned before, um, I am the 4-H Youth Development Extension Agent in Greensville Emporia. And I'm excited to be here today with you all to share a fun and delicious recipe that I hope you all enjoy. Next slide, please. So potatoes are considered a vegetable. Um, if you look to the right of the screen, um, you'll see a copy of the United States Department of Agriculture's MyPlate. Um, and this is a nutritional guideline that the USDA um, gives to us um, as a guide of what we should be eating um, daily. So as you can see, vegetables are a large portion of what we should be eating in our diet, and potatoes do fall in that category. Um, potatoes are good sources of vitamin C, potassium, um, vitamin B6, and fiber. And although they are good sources of various different types of nutrients, I do also want to mention that um, these are vegetables that we should probably limit our consumption of. You don't want to go crazy and um, eat all potatoes and no leafy greens or any other vegetables um, because some potatoes are starchy and they do contain um, high carbohydrates. So you want to be cautious and um, eat them in moderation. And as a reminder, if you do eat potatoes, um, we would recommend that you would either um, bake them or cook them in a different way other than frying them. Now, if you um, are growing your own potatoes at home, or even if you're purchasing them from the store, um, there are some recommendations on storing your potatoes. You want to keep them in a cool, dark, well-ventilated place. And with that being said, you want them to also be in a dry place. You don't want your potatoes to be wet because that could cause them to rot. It's recommended that you use your potatoes within three to five weeks. And as was mentioned earlier by Thomas, you wanna be careful with the sun. If you, if you put your potatoes in the sunlight, um, they'll start to turn green, like this photo here depicts, and that could be toxic to you. So you wanna make sure that they are in a cool, dark environment so they will not turn green. And the last thing that I would like to mention is, um, even if you're harvesting in your garden or if you're purchasing from the store, you always wanna wash your produce before consuming it. Um, so we always wanna get in the good practice of always washing our produce um, before we cook and consume. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna learn how to make um, a delicious recipe and I hope you all enjoy it. Hi everyone, my name is Hannah Parker and I'm the 4-H Extension Agent in Greensville County in the city of Emporia. Today, we're gonna learn how to make cheese stuffed twice baked potatoes. The recipe selected for today's session is provided by Virginia Cooperative Extension's Family Nutrition Program and highlights the MyPlate food groups of vegetables and dairy. This recipe yields eight servings. One serving consists of two potato halves or one full potato. It will take a total of 50 minutes to prepare and cook the recipe. Key ingredient, the potato, is known as the most popular vegetable among children in the United States. Potatoes are a good source of vitamin C, potassium, vitamin B6, and fiber. Before we get started, we need to make sure that we are being safe when we're in the kitchen. In order to do that, we must first make sure our hands are clean. And when we're washing our hands, make sure you are washing your hands for at least 20 seconds under warm water and with soap. Next, we must remember if we have long hair to tie it back in a ponytail 
or put it behind our ears. Finally, you need to make sure if you're wearing any jewelry, go ahead and remove that or tuck it into your shirt so no items of our belonging will fall into the food today. For today's recipe, you will need the following ingredients and equipment. Eight medium baking potatoes. These can either be red or white potatoes. Two tablespoons of chopped onion. One cup of low fat cottage cheese. One fourth of a cup of reduced fat shredded cheddar cheese. Two tablespoons of milk. And one fourth teaspoon of paprika. First, we must wash all of the produce, including our potatoes and our onions. Next, we will preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, place clean potatoes onto a baking sheet, and bake potatoes in the oven for 30 to 40 minutes until tender. Once your potatoes are baked, you will then slice each potato in half lengthwise. Remember to keep your fingers back when slicing your potatoes. Next, you will use a spoon to scoop out the inside of each potato into a bowl. Leave about one fourth inch of the potato next to the skin and save to restuff your potato. Once you have sliced your potatoes and hollowed out your potatoes, you're going to set them back on your cooking sheet so we can stuff them. All right, now that we have hollowed out our potatoes, we're gonna make the filling for the inside of our cheese stuffed twice potatoes. So we already have our potatoes um, in our bowl. Next, we're gonna add our one cup of low fat cottage cheese. All right, next we're gonna add our two tablespoons of milk. Next, we're gonna have our two tablespoons of chopped onion. Right, now that we have all of our ingredients inside of our bowl, we're gonna mash it with a potato masher. So you're gonna come in here and mix it real good. And don't be shy, because you want it to be nice and mixed so it's a nice consistency. So just keep on mashing. You can also use a fork to do this. So you're gonna take your filling and you're gonna stuff your potatoes just like this. And you want to make sure each of your potatoes gets stuffed. Now that your potatoes are stuffed, we're going to take our one fourth of a cup of shredded cheese and we are going to sprinkle that cheese over top of our filling. All right, there we go. We got our cheese on top of our potatoes. And then now what we would do is sprinkle paprika over top all of our potatoes. And you can see here our finished product. We have cheese stuff, twice potatoes. Um, this half has paprika, and then this half is non-paprika. All right, now that our potatoes are all done, we're gonna take our potatoes and we're gonna bring them to the oven. Now our oven has already been preheated to 400 degrees. And we're gonna open it up. We're gonna place it on the top rack. We're gonna set our bake time to five minutes, and then we're gonna come back and see what we made. All right, now that our baked potatoes have baked in the oven for five minutes, it's time to bring them out and see how they did. And remember, when you're getting your baked potatoes out, be sure to use a, a oven mitt so we don't hurt ourselves. And here we go, they look delicious and I hope you enjoy. Alrighty, well, I hope you enjoyed that um, short video of um, me making the recipe. Um, I will say it was very delicious and I do encourage you all to try it. Um, and it actually was a lot of fun to make it as well. Um, so now that our presentation is over, are there any questions from the audience? There are. We thank you, Thomas and Hannah, for sharing your presentations with us today. And we have had quite a few questions that have come in. So I am just going to go down through. We will try to 
make time for all of them. But one of the questions that did come up towards the beginning, Thomas, when you were talking about the production side of things, um, and Hannah mentioned it as well, uh, if you mistakenly eat a green part of a potato when you were talking about it greening, what should you do? And um, is it maybe something that you would need to go to the hospital or seek medical care for? I'm going to go with a standard extension answer of it depends. So it depends on how much you've consumed and how it's making you feel. If you eat a lot of the green part of tomatoes, or excuse me, potatoes, um, you're li likely going to, to feel some symptoms. Um, most of the time when people ha bite into a potato that's had some greening, um, as long as they're not consuming the whole thing, they should be okay. But if you feel ill from it, then you should seek medical attention. Well, that makes sense. Um, so we would just advise you to see how you're feeling. Um, there was a question that came across about um, how late could you plant seed potatoes for a fall crop? So if people are thinking about getting prepared for the fall, um, what's a good time frame and when is when has it been too late to get started? So if you recall that most potatoes are 100, 120 days um, until maturity and harvest, you want to kind of count backwards from when your average first frost is. Potatoes, like I said, can take a, a mild frosting and recover from, from it, but if they get a hard freeze, that's going to kill them. The problem with a fall harvest is that slugs are bigger and more active, um, so that's something to think of, so you may want to just do it for new potatoes. But I would count backwards from when your last, or excuse me, when your estimated first frost is, and give yourself some time to get those in there. I'll also say that, you know, potatoes are generally cooler season um, plants. You know, think about where they originated from up in the Andes, so it's a cooler temperature. So you, they're gonna be a little more susceptible to drought stress and heat stress. So just make sure you're watching them and uh, giving them adequate water I want to think, um, so our fro last frost date where I am is the end of October. And I want to think one year we tried um, early August to plant them. And they did okay. Um, we didn't get nearly as much of a harvest as we did um, planting them in the spring. But like I said, look at your average first frost date and then kind of count backwards from that. Which makes sense. Um, I know potatoes can be tricky. So um, one of the things that I know has been growing popularity and we had somebody ask about it is container gardening. And someone did ask about your opinion of potato bags. You shared with us the lazy method of growing it, you know, out on the soil and not below the soil. But have you had any experience with those, Thomas? I've had a little bit. And so for those of you who don't know, basically bag potatoes are, instead of planting in soil, you put soil in a bag, you have the bag opened up so that obviously so the plants can get sun and grow, but as they grow, you're hilling, but you're hilling in the bag. And the idea is instead of having to dig, you just slice the bag open for your potatoes. Um, the few times I've tried it, I haven't been quite as successful but I also know people who've been very successful with it. Uh, the biggest thing, if you're gonna grow it in some other kind of container, you know, a pot or something like that, is that you really need to make sure that you have a pot that's not big, that's not so big that you can't lift it to dump it out when you need to harvest. The other thing I will say about both the bags and doing it in pots, make sure you have a really good drainage or your potatoes are gonna rot on you. I know I've actually seen on um, Amazon, which is where I think everybody goes to look for things, that they actually make potato bags now that um, 
are meant to grow the potatoes in and they actually have like a side of them that will open up from the side so you don't even have to cut your bag open so I don't know if that's what they were referring to but I have seen those lately and I wondered you know what kind of success people have with them no they're, they're very effective I grew potatoes in bags most of the time I grew potatoes in bags I should say is before we had those bag specific um, and that was drainage was a big thing um, in the purpose-built potato bags they usually have good drainage um, and that's a really easy way to do it um, and honestly if you're thinking containers I would go with bags over pots because it'll be so much easier and um, when you were talking about um, the containers and hilling, someone had asked earlier um, if you could just go over what hilling is again and maybe a little bit more specific in that. Sure. Actually, let me jump back real quick. If you're growing potatoes in, con in containers, make sure you use soil and not potting mix. Um, at least at the beginning because you wanna make sure you've got enough nutrients for those potatoes. Potting mix makes great structure, but you're gonna to have to fertilize if you use potting mix. So back to hilling. So hilling basically, you want the potatoes to sprout and have good green growth for about five, six inches. And then you'll go back and you'll cover a half to two thirds of that with soil. And as the plant continues to grow up another several inches, when it's about five or six inches, again, you hill it with enough soil so that about half of it's covered. And the idea is that because potatoes grow up, unlike sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes will grow down, you'll get sweet potatoes growing lower than where you plant them. With Indian potatoes, they're gonna grow up. And so you wanna create more of a volume so you'll have more potatoes. I hope that is clear enough. But if the person who asked that question, if I didn't answer that as completely as you really wanted, email me, I'm happy to have a conversation with you about specific questions. Yes, and um, I know that um, Typically, after these presentations are over, the information will also be shared out. So your contact information should be there. So in case they have some more specific uh, questions. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, and so there was a question. You spoke briefly about soil and making sure um, that you had nutrients in your soil. And so there was a question that had come up about um, was it true that once you planted a crop, you um, that a, the crop can use up all the nutrients in the soil, so you would need to move to another piece of land? I know you briefly talked about soil and road, road, crop rotation, but um, could you speak to that? So if we're talking production, a lot of times they don't rotate fields, and they have to put back more nutrients into soil or they have to rotate to another area. In backyard gardening a lot of times you don't have the space to rotate um, so it's really important to to build that soil and to have rich organic soil. At our demonstration garden we've never had to fertilize potatoes and we do that by one being able to rotate from bed to bed and the other thing is to use cover crops over the winter that will add nutrients back into the soil. And so a lot of times we'll put a mix of crimson clover and uh, cereal rye together and grow those into the bed that we're gonna move potatoes in. The cereal rye will take up any nitrogen that might get leached away while the crimson clover is producing nitrogen because it's a legume. And so you're storing up all that energy and then that cover crop will release that energy back into the soil and you've got a highly, um, highly fertile soil to use. And it also does take a little bit of time. It, it's gonna take several years to take, you know, basically a compacted clay like we see in a lot of Virginia, particularly in suburban Virginia, 
and transform that into a really deep and healthy soil, but it can be done. And soil health is a whole nother presentation. Um, and again, if you have questions in more detail, happy to, to answer those offline. Great, well, we thank you, um, Thomas and Hannah both. Um, we appreciate all of you interacting with us today. And I'll toss it back over to Lena for any last words. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending and thank you, Thomas, Hannah, Mary Beth. Um, so we have another session next week that will focus on tomatoes. It'll be next Friday at 2 p.m. So you can register for that at our virtual Farm to Table website, which is listed there, um, but I'll also send it out in an email to all of the people that registered for this session. Um, I'll also send out the um, the two videos that Thomas had mentioned, the uh, Love of the Chip video, and then there's an NRCS soil health um, video series, actually. So I'll send out the links to those so you can easily access. Um, when you close today's session, a uh, pop-up will come up asking you to take a quick survey. Um, so if you could fill out that survey and give us a little bit of feedback, we do appreciate it. Um, so I hope everyone has a great weekend and hopefully we'll see you at another virtual farm to table session. Bye everyone.